Thanks for checking out Lonesome Grave Trail. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and leave a comment below, so we can keep bringing you more Wild West adventures. Chapter 1 The Carson Sink Camp was an oasis to those emigrants who had traveled near 3,000 miles to view fabled California, and at the same time it was a disappointment, for the high barrier of the Sierra Nevadas still lay between them and the promised gold of the Sacramento Valley. Willow-lined Argonaut Creek, and a few gnarled sycamores gave their modicum of shade to the camp where incoming emigrant trains rested galled and weary oxen before going on. Here a man who had been misfortune's victim might find an opportunity to join some ongoing train. That at least was Rip Campbell hope. But as the weary weeks had passed and no Conestoga caravan had lifted high tilts above the desert's eastern edge, he had almost ceased to hope for the coming of a wagon monster who might find a place for a scout with a crippled hand. Rip flexed his fingers as he took his accustomed afternoon seat on a tall boulder at the edge of the creek camp. From the rock he could watch for sign of wagons making their slow way here across the salt desert. The eyes of friendly women in the emigrant camp where a few families had decided to wait through the winter before tackling the long onward trail to Oregon, watched Rip sympathetically. They saw him seated, then shook their heads sadly, and their tongues began to clack. One shook her head worriedly. I hear tell from that last trapper who come through that Sioux on the plains have slaughtered so many emigrants that none are making it across South Pass. And them that have reached Salt Lake are being forced to pay the Mormons tribute. I wonder what's going to happen to that poor Rip Campbell. I have heard it said, the woman's companion answered, that Mr. Campbell is apt to strike out for California alone if a train doesn't come along soon. And he's just the one to take that chance. A shame it is that the pack of trappers and scouts who brought him here couldn't have waited until his fever was gone before pulling out. What if his hand was caught in a beaver trap by accident? I still can't see why they didn't wait for his health to mend. Particularly after they told me he stood high in the councils of mountain men. He insisted that they go on, the first woman explained patiently. He is not a man to be burdensome to anyone. And now that he can hold a rifle again, you know that the game he has brought in has been worth more than its weight in that California goal people brag about. He's more than paid back our kindness. For one, I hope he stays the winter. Her voice trailed off as she stared unseeingly off to the west. As he hunched atop his lookout, Rip knew that he was the subject of conversation beneath the sycamores, and the knowledge made his ears feel hot. Grimly, he went to work flexing his right hand, trying patiently to force resilience into muscles that time alone would knit. Yes, time. And until that hand was good as new, Rip Campbell knew bitterly that he could not strike out for California alone. Slowly he twisted on his hard seat, a long, wide-shouldered man in travel-worn buckskins and crow moccasins. He let his agate brown eyes wander westward across wide leagues of dangerous desert to the towering barrier of the Blue Sierra. Beyond those mountains lay the Golden Valley of the Sacramento, mecca of thousands since a nugget had been found in the mill race of Sutter's sawmill at Coloma. More than the lure of nuggets in American River Gravel, though, was calling Rip Campbell to California. It was the same urge that had made him disobey a father who had insisted on the completion of a college career for which he had no taste. Restlessness was what some men call it, fiddle-footed. And yet the real truth was that ten years spent on the frontier had not brought him contentment, for he could not be sure just what he was seeking. That was why he stared at the distant blue of pine-clad Sierra and the savage dun hue of the salt desert. It was why he wished glumly that he was already there in that yonder land beyond the mountains. For somehow, Rip had the feeling that his restless days would end in California, perhaps on some oak-shaded rancho where a man could grow with a new state. If only a caravan would come, one willing to take a cripple on with them. He could support the barrel of a rifle in that right hand now, but the fingers would not close enough yet to grasp the green river blade at his belt, or hold the weight of the long navy colt holstered at his opposite thigh. 
He could not hoist an ox yoke or handle an axe, but he could sit a horse and his eyes were keen. Dispiritedly, Rip turned back from his contemplation of the peaks that barred him from California, and as he switched his long length around, something that none of the Carson camp people had seen in a long time caught his eye. It was dust. Dust billowing high into an azure, cloudless sky. Dust kicked up by the hooves of plodding oxen. Dust rolling upward from beneath high Conestoga wheels. A caravan was coming, at last. He let out a shout that he couldn't hold back left Rip's lips. He saw figures in the camp beneath the sycamores spring to their feet, men and women alike. They came pell-mell toward his lookout rock, and their cries echoed his own shout. Born faces began to smile. Children in homespun raced about with glee, for they knew there would be youngsters in the approaching train with whom to play. Men running low on tobacco showed their hopefulness of replacing dwindling supplies. The women thought of news they might learn. Rip thought that now he might be able to start on the last lap of his journey to California. Purple shadows were washing over the salt desert by the time the incoming train splashed across the ford of Argonaut Creek. Gaunt oxen wheeled high-tilted Conestoga and Pittsburgh wagons into an open section of the camp, and Rip watched the scene from his place on the high rock. He had asked Eli Saunders, the camp boss, to get word to the wagon master of the incoming train that a man was here who wanted to hook up with their outfit. It would break the ice when he approached the leader of the new caravan. But even as he thought about it, Rip felt a frown growing on his forehead. Eyes that years of frontier living had sharpened saw things about this new batch of emigrants that he couldn't understand. One oddity immediately caught his attention. The travel-stained women of the caravan were making no attempt to greet the emigrants' wives already settled in this Carson sink camp. There was a sullenness about them that was hard to understand. The men, too, were going about the task of rounding the cattle with unaccustomed haste into the wagon circle they had formed. Others were cutting wood and keeping to themselves. Still others were silently unyoking the weary oxen. It was that silence which puzzled Rip. Making camp was usually a noisy, boisterous undertaking. One man, bigger than the rest in quilled buckskin, appeared to be their leader. His movements about the camp were quick and lithe as a cougar's. A magnificent mane of black hair reached back to the beaded collar of his leather shirt. When he was near, Rip noticed that men jumped to hurry their tasks. A regular he-heller, the scout muttered half to himself. Carson camp emigrants, who had been joyfully awaiting the sight of new faces and new tongues to bring them word of happenings along the Oregon-California Trace, were slowly retreating toward their own wagons in abashed confusion. Beats me, a voice muttered from the base of the rock. Rip looked down. Eli Saunders was staring up at him out of puzzled blue eyes. I ain't never seen a bunch like that before, he confided. Stand offish as all get out. Their captain, that fellow in the frilled breeches, calls himself Bart Archer. I told him we had a feller wanting to hitch up with them, and he's willing to talk with you. He don't have no remarks to make concerning their back trail. Just don't have nothing to say except they are pulling out come morning. Rip had noticed another thing about the mystery caravan. Their stock is gaunt and pretty bad, he told the camp boss as he slid to the ground. A smart captain would rest up for a couple of days before tackling the desert ahead. I know that as well as you, Saunders snapped irritably. There's something funny about the outfit. Twelve wagons archers got, and that don't seem like a proper size train for crossing plains and mountains. Most captains wait until they can get leastways twice that number before striking out from Council Grove. Everything Eli Saunders had said was true, and Rip knew that the camp boss was hoping that he would not press his chance to go on with an outfit that acted so strangely. I'd wait over, Eli, he murmured as they approached the new camp, except that I've got to get started for California pronto if I expect to get there before Sierra Snow blocks Emigrant Gap. Rip ducked beneath a wagon tongue tilted to the end gate of the Conestoga ahead as a girl popped her head through the opening in the tilt above him. Oh, 
Rip heard her say in surprise and he glanced up and straightened. You, she began again. I'm from yonder camp, ma'am, Rip told her politely, and the smile that came to his lips was the most spontaneous that had touched his face in months. I've come to see if your captain will take me on to California, he explained. The girl had been lovely, and would be lovely again when the fatigue of this long journey was out of her bones. Tiredness showed in the fine lines etched about her red lips, and in the shadows beneath her dark eyes. Her body was slender, and yet rounded beneath the drab brown of her dress. But as he studied her, Rip read more than fatigue in her face. Fear, sorrow, or both had keyed her to a tight pitch. He watched the girl's lips part, and then suddenly close at the sound of a step behind him. He had already heard the whisper of moccasins, but the expression that crossed the girl's face had kept him from turning. Now, as he saw the words she had been about to speak freeze on her lips, he swung without undue haste to see who was approaching. The black-haired leader of the caravan stood there, but for a moment Bart Archer ignored the crippled scout. His eyes, blacker if possible than his hair, were tipped up to the girl in the wagon. Salah, he said sharply, your mother is asking for you. I, I was just going to help her, the girl stammered, when, when this gentleman surprised me. She started to climb down across the end gate, and natural courtesy made Rip step forward to help her. Without thinking, he lifted his right hand and caught the girl's elbow. But as her weight came against his palm, pain leapt to his shoulder. Instinct made him lose his grip, and sweat broke on his forehead. Payne had whitened his lips when the girl looked up. I've hurt you, she exclaimed. Mr. Campbell, Rip muttered. Don't feel bad about my hand. It's ached a heap sight worse. I'm Salah Burns, the girl said, and her smile was friendly. She was probably twenty-one, but Bart Archer treated her as though she were a child or a chattel of his own. If you don't get to helping your mother and the rest of the women prepare supper, You'll find yourself hungry, he warned coldly. Rip watched her speed from them, and her run was graceful as the flight of a falling leaf. After she had joined the other women about the cook fire, Rip made another slow turn to face the mystery caravan's leader, and he realized instantly that a more inopportune meeting could not have been arranged. Archer's face was long and gaunt. Even in the heat of this high desert, it looked chilly but there was nothing chilly about his eyes. Hellfire and damnation burned in their depths. Bart Archer wanted no man to look twice at Salah Burns. You're the one Saunders was talking to me about, the captain said abruptly. Rip nodded carefully. Yes, he admitted. A trap caught my hand when me and some partners made a set this side of Salt Lake, just for luck. It was luck all right, but the wrong kind for me. Blood poison set in. I made my friends go on and leave me here. The women in this camp saved my hand, but it ain't much use yet. However, it's good enough to handle a rifle and ram home a ball. My eyes ain't bad either when it comes to picking up Injun sign, so I figured I might scout and hunt for my keep. Rip watched Archer's eyes narrow, and he was braced for the captain's no. But the exact opposite was coming. Ever been to California before? Bart Archer asked. At the shake of Rip's head, he seemed pleased. I think we can use you, Campbell, he said crisply. You'll eat with the rest of us. We're well found and I've copies of maps Colonel Fremont made when he and Kit Carson crossed Walker Pass into Owens Valley. It will cut a hundred or more miles off the regular route, over Emigrant Gap. Words were on Rip's lips, but he stifled them. John C. Fremont with Kit Carson for guide had found and named Walker Pass all right. But this train was already far north of the path those explorers had blazed in 1844. Thus Bart Archer was either stupid or a liar, and the captain did not look stupid. Why was this man purporting to lead his train of a dozen wagons over a shortcut into California's promised land, when the route he wanted lay far to the south, Rip asked himself, and he found no answer in his mind. Time might give him the solution, and suddenly the scout knew that wild horses could not keep him from accompanying this mystery caravan. You've hired a hand, Archer, he murmured. I've my own horse, a bay gelding named Ranger. He'll be glad to travel again, 
and so will I. Our worst danger from here on will be the Paiutes. They're lizard-eating coyotes, who will fill a man with arrows if they get him alone. Otherwise, they will concentrate on your herds. I hear they have a taste for ox meat. You have heard a lot, Campbell. The train captain's long, narrow face had hardened. And I hope you will keep your fears to yourself. We do not discuss matters that might rouse concern in the caravan. Good night to you now, and be ready on that ranger horse of yours to pull out in the morning. Rip nodded, and he wondered if he could manage to keep his temper under control for the long leagues that still lay between them and California. I will do my best, he murmured. One more thing before you leave, Bart Archer snapped as Rip turned to go. You might as well know that Salah Burns is my intended wife. She and her mother are traveling to California under my personal escort. Rip felt his lips draw in against his teeth. I'll remember, he murmured. He turned and walked away. Eli Saunders met the scout along the creek on the way back to the main. And what do you think of that outfit? Rip walked a few paces before answering. I think, he said finally, that it is a caravan full of fear and hatred. Archer is playing a game, and he is using human beings for his chessmen. Chapter 2 Catch Up, Catch Up That cry for five days now had awakened Rip at each dawn. Five days, fifty miles, and the Sierras seemed no nearer. They were still a blue barrier barring the southern horizon, but the Dun Desert was very real about them. Paiutes lurked in cutbank washes, eager to drive off the cavy that followed under heavy guard behind the lumbering wagons. Two dozen cattle in one lightning raid had been lost, and one of the guards had died in the attack, his body riddled with arrows. They had buried him alongside the dim trace. Wing scout for the caravan, Rip was away from the wagons between each dawn and dusk, which gave him no opportunity to speak alone with Salah Burns. And as the cook fire. Fourth evenings, talk was out of the question. After the night meal, each family sought their own wagon. None of the jolly group singing that made Argonauts forget the hazards of the day was evident. Nothing livened the drabness. It helped to increase Rip's impression that something was wrong here. The sixth night came, and the Sierras seemed miraculously nearer. The apparent nearness of the mountains brought smiles to the gaunt faces of women, and the harried lips of men who hadn't smiled in days. Rip watched Salah Burns rise from the circle where all were eating, and she said clearly enough for all to hear, This is a night for song. I have a banjo in my trunk, but mother has a lot of things packed on top of it. Mr. Campbell, won't you come and help me get it? We'll treat the folks to, oh, Susanna. It is my chore, Bart Archer said smoothly and rose from his seat. A man with a bad hand shouldn't be lifting packing cases. My hand, Rip said, and he hardly recognized his own voice, is fine. Bart Archer's laugh was chilly as the snows that would soon mantle the Sierras. He came stepping toward the scout, and Rip found himself moving forward to meet the man. He caught a glimpse of Salah Burns frightened face, and then the girl was trying to step between them. Rip brushed her aside with his good arm. This had to come sometime, Salah. One man's got to be tall around here. It won't be you, Campbell, Archer spoke through set, handsome lips. The captain lashed out with a whistling blow, and like a dancer, Rip ducked. You've got to do better than that, he taunted, hoping his words might blind Archer with fury. He sent his own left looping out as he spoke, and the blow grazed the captain's cheek. Archer's fists came then like driving pistons. A blow on the chest staggered Rip backward. A right smashed through his guard, and he felt the salt taste of blood in his mouth as gore spurted from his nose. The captain was pressing his advantage, boring forward deliberately step by step, and the scout knew he was beaten. His right hand would not close into a fist, and one stabbing left was not enough to protect himself against the flailing knuckles of the wagon master. Stand and take it, damn you, Bart Archer rasped. Rip had been constantly backing, hopeful that he might yet draw the captain within range of a left powerful enough to drop him. Against his back then, 
he felt the sudden heat of the community cook fire, and he knew that another backward pace would carry him into it. He took a single step forward and hammered a desperate left straight toward the triumphant face of the wagon master, but the blow found nothing but thin air. Archer's right had risen from the neighborhood of his waist, and hard knuckles beneath his chin were lifting him from his feet. Rip felt the powerful muscles in his own body growing lax. There was no strength left in his knees. He saw the ground rising, and had only one vagrant glow of satisfaction. He had kept his head, and managed to refrain from striking a blow with his weakened right hand. Then he was on the ground, and the blow to his jaw had paralyzed him from head to heel. Unconsciousness was coming, yet oddly it was not here yet. He could still see dimly and hear. He saw Bart Archer loom above him, saw the man's hobnailed boot rise, and he read the wicked intent in the other's eyes. He heard Salah Burns cry out, and he heard the hoarse voice of one of the emigrants exclaim, Leave be, Archer, we felt the same as you when we split from Jim Carpenter's party and started on alone. We owe Carpenter all the trouble we can make him, but this feller wasn't one of them. Leave be, I say. Throw him out if you want for the Paiutes too. Scalp, but I draw the line at tromping him. He had been tromped just the same. That was the first conscious thought Rip had, when heat that seared his body like the white blast from a furnace roused him to consciousness. He tried to open his eyes and failed, and for a terrorized moment he thought his sight was gone. Then the realization came that dried blood had glued his lids together. Thirst burned. His throat, and every muscle throbbed with its own individual song of pain. Some emigrant had remonstrated with Archer, Rip remembered dazedly. But the caravan captain had tromped him just the same. The emigrant had suggested that they throw him out on the salt desert for the Paiutes to scalp, and Rip, exploring blindly with his hand, touched brittle sage in sand. The feel of it made him want to laugh, but he couldn't, for his tongue seemed cloven to his mouth. They'd done a good job in that caravan of mystery, was the wild thought that came into his fogged mind. Yes, a damn fine job. Abandoned him to the Paiutes and the sun, while their wagons rolled on westward. Another wave of unconsciousness was sweeping over him, and he tried to fight it with all the power of his will. Go to sleep again, he muttered the words aloud in an effort to rouse himself completely, and you'll never see California and that rancho looking out to the sea. But the unconsciousness was coming despite his talk, and yet oddly enough, a girl's voice seemed to be coming right along with it. Rip, Rip. I've found you. It sounded like Salah Burns, but Rip knew that couldn't be true. Bart Archer would never have given her the chance to slip away from the caravan. That was his last conscious thought. Then blackness swept over him. The sensation of being pulled through scrubby sage that ripped at his buckskin clothes, and of being slid as gently as possible down the steep sides of a cut bank wash, was the next impression that roused the scout. This ain't the road to hell, he heard himself chuckle wildly. It's too hot down there for sage and sand. Rip, that feminine voice said again, and water, blessedly cool, touched his lips. A damp cloth was at his face suddenly, sponging the dried blood from his eyes and nose. With an effort, the scout managed to pry his lids apart. For an instant they sagged back as though to close, and then surprise jerked him to full awareness. Staring unbelievingly up, he looked into the face of the Argonaut girl. Salah. The water had lubricated his throat and loosened his tongue. Salah. You. Here. I. Don't try to talk, the girl commanded. I left your rifle where I found you. Rest until I come back. Here, she pressed a pitifully small leather water bag into his hands. Drink when you get thirsty. Roused completely, Rip felt the weight of the bottle. We'll save it for later, he murmured, and he had to fight down the almost uncontrollable urge to lift the bag to his lips and drain its last drop. Brain whirling with speculation, he lay still feeling the little water he already had drunk start to bring the tingle of life back to a body that had been mercilessly beaten. 
Shimmering heat devils danced at the rim of the dun-hued cut bank wash across from him. Heat devils that would destroy them unless more water could be found quickly. And the Paiutes had a habit of lurking near the water holes waiting for lost Argonauts, or men separated from their wagons. There was another danger, too. Salah had not wasted her strength to drag him into this deep wash without reason. Evidently the fear was in her that Bart Archer and his men might come looking for them. The thought made Rip glance down at his right hand. He hadn't had much time to think about it, but now the sight of his arm brought a chuckle to his lips. The hand still wasn't worth much, but Archer and his tromping boots had neglected to undo the slow healing process by smashing it a second time. That single fact was something a man could almost take as a good omen. But we'll need plenty more, Rip muttered, before we make it back to the Carson camp. I wonder if she managed to steal a horse for us to ride. He heard the crisp sound of the girl's small boots coming back to the wash, and it was his answer. Salah Burns had left the mystery caravan on foot. Rip pulled a ragged breath into his lungs. Swiftly, he calculated the miles they had traveled away from the Carson sink camp. Six days at ten or twelve miles a day. There were water holes along the backward trail, but there were Paiutes too. That knowledge was a challenge, and Rip accepted it as such. A girl with the bravery of Salah Burns deserved better than a desert death. We'll make it through, he told himself. I'm not going to let her die. She came sliding into the wash, and her face grew radiant as she saw how he had managed to prop himself against the bank. You're better, she exclaimed. I was afraid they'd broken an arm or one of your legs. Salah was wearing a boy's hickory shirt and brown corduroy breeches. At least she wouldn't be burdened with a woman's bulky clothes on the walk to come. In one hand, Rip saw that she had his rifle, powder horn, and shot pouch. In the other, she carried a weighted flour sack. Crouched down beside him, she opened the sack and spilled forth its contents. Your revolver, she said proudly. I thought we might need six quick loads in case six Paiutes saw us all at once. She laughed almost gaily. And bread, she went on, and jerked ox meat from the last one we had to slaughter. So we won't have to turn into lizard eaters, Rip. Rip Campbell looked at the girl, and he couldn't understand her. She had been sullen, tired, and fearful in Archer's camp. But there had been the security of numbers. Now she was alone on the desert. With a man to whom she'd spoken no more than a dozen words, facing the crazed death that thirst brought, or the shattering horror of a flint-tipped arrow in the back. Yet she could smile. It brought back to his mind all the strangeness he'd sensed in the archer caravan. Questions filled his mind, but there were more pressing matters to settle first. The girl handed him a bit of bread, torn from the loaf she had. Displayed, and a strip of jerky. Breakfast, she said gaily. Rip accepted the food, and even the movement of laying it on his lap brought torment to bruised muscles. Talk comes first, he told her gravely. We've got to decide some things right now. I make it close to 65 miles back to Carson, sink, and death will be waiting for us every inch of the way. Your outfit can't be more than five or six miles ahead, even. If they moved on without you. Rip spoke slowly because the words were hard to bring out. My, my advice to you is to leave me this stuff and head back to them. You can walk faster than oxen can pull a wagon. You'll meet up with them by sunset and be safe again. Stay with me, Rip cut his sentence short. Ears keen to habitual alertness had picked up the sound of hooves out along the trace. With a movement as clumsy as an old man trying to rise from a chair, the scout pushed the water bag aside and pulled himself to his feet. Lithe as a fawn, Salah Burns was already pressed against the bank, dark eyes on a level with the lip of it. Archer. Her whisper came faintly to the scout, and he had never heard a word spoken with more venom. Kill him, Rip, the girl implored. Shoot him while you've got the chance. He's more dangerous than a mad dog. Kill him, Rip. Chapter 3 Rip was silent for a time, trying to remember Archer's talk to the henchman 
who had ridden out here with him in search of his body. Archer had said that Salah knew nothing, that none of the emigrants knew his plans. And as he had raked spurs into Ranger's tender flanks, he had mentioned that something would happen within a few more days. Something would happen in days that were vital now, for evenings brought their warning chill of snows to come, and wagons that were to make California this year had to be through Emigrant Gap ahead of them. There's one thing certain, he said slowly. Bart Archer ain't aiming to take your outfit by way of Walker Pass. You pass the cutoff to Owens Valley many a mile back of Carson Sink. That's what a lot of us surmised, Salah Burns said. It's one of the reasons the camp has been so glum and full of fear. But we've had to stick with Archer because there just wasn't anything else we could do. Oh, Rip, I, I had a half-crazy idea when I slipped out of the camp to come and find you that perhaps if I was successful we could backtrack and meet Jim Carpenter's train. Rip looked at her, a smile turning. His bruised lips. You and me, he grunted, are thinking a lot alike right now. How far back you figure his outfit to be? I don't know, the girl hesitated. Archer has pushed us regardless of loss to our oxen, since we parted company. Carpenter was always careful to see that we laid over in good campsites every few days to rest our cattle. Which makes for faster time when you do catch up and roll, the scout said thoughtfully. Maybe he ain't more than two or three days behind. Maybe not that far. If we're real lucky, we might run into them this side of Carson Sink. He stopped right there, knowing that if he said any more he'd put fear into the heart of a girl who had already suffered enough torment. Two days, three, they might last with the meager food she had been able to bring. But they would need water. And Paiute warriors, as inconspicuous as the darting brown lizards on the dun earth, watched every hole. Thinking of water, Rip reached for the bag they had both avoided. His hand touched the leather and seemed to freeze to its flabby surface. Slowly, a little unbelievingly, he let his head swing around and tip down. A stunted cactus, stubby enough to pass unnoticed, grew in a slight fold of the wash. The earth about it was dark now and damp. Salah Burns had seen the incredulous expression that crossed the scout's bruised face. Rip, she scrambled around him, and her small hand snatched the limp container. A few drops of water oozed lazily from the rent bottom of the bag. Like something to love, she held the bag against her breast for an agonized moment. Then Rip saw the caricature of a brave smile touch her lips. There, there's still a little left, she stammered. I, I'm not thirsty. You drink it, Rip. No. He spoke the word explosively realizing how the accident had occurred. It must have hit the bag with my hand when I got up to take a look-see at Archer and his cronies. It landed on the cactus. Only a fool like me would have been so danged careless with something we need so much, now. Now, Salah Burns' hickory shirt stirred as she drew a deep breath. We've got to find a water hole, and Rip knew she was thinking of the Paiutes who might be waiting for them. He rose with an effort that he tried to conceal from the girl. Stiffness was coming to take the place of pain in his battered body. Teeth tight against his lip, he stumbled to the opposite rim of the wash. Behind his back, he heard the girl ask simply, How far is it to water? Rip calculated swiftly. The last hole where we filled the barrels is nigh on fifteen miles away, he said reluctantly. The girl's thin face cleared. Why, that's not far. We'll make it by midnight, if we walk three miles an hour. Rip felt the stiffness of his muscles. We will, he said dryly, if we can make three miles an hour. Night covered the salt, and the glory of stars overhead sprinkled the ruts of the trace with faint radiance. Under different circumstances, Rip knew as they plodded along, he would have considered the desert beautiful. But this night, the story was different. Every folded wash and every silhouetted clump of cactus and sage held potential danger for them. Watching the girl, Rip could see that each step was becoming more of an effort, and yet she was making a brave attempt to match his own faltering stride. Rip figured they had covered ten slow miles already. 
A few more at the most lay in front of them. He saw the girl's face turn toward him, and she gestured at a flat boulder alongside the trace. Rip shook his head. We've got to keep moving, he croaked the words painfully. Stop now and the chill will get in our bones. Then we can't walk. He put his right hand under the girl's elbow to help her. A sharper rise than most in this wide salt desert lay before them. As their leaden feet started to push them toward its crest, sudden remembrance came to the scout. Beyond this ridge, in a thicket of mesquite, sage, and cactus, lay the spring they were seeking. We've made it, he croaked to the girl and felt relief make her sag against him, then once again she straightened sturdily. But they hadn't made it ten minutes later. He had left Salah below the ridge line and bellied his own cautious way up for a look at the spring beyond. At first he'd thought the dark objects scattered haphazardly about the mesquite copse were boulders, and then memory brought its sharp reminder. There had been no piles of stone about the spring two days before, when the archer caravan had filled their barrels and watered thirsty stock. The objects he was viewing now, Rip realized with a sinking gauntness in his stomach, were rude brush teepees built by a band of Paiutes. They had come here to gather beans from the mesquite trees growing about the waterhole, he guessed. There was only one thing they could do, Rip decided bleakly as he scanned the camp. That was to circle it and put enough distance between themselves and the Paiutes so that no roving warrior might locate them. But first they had to have water. That knowledge was like an unscalable wall facing them. He heard a stir of motion at his back and Salah Burns pressed close alongside. You were gone so long I started to worry, she whispered, and then her eyes found the brush huts. Rip felt her stiffen. That's the reason, he husked. We've still got to have water. The girl's voice trailed into silence. And in silence, Rip studied the layout below them. Gradually one fact became apparent to him. All of the huts faced away from them. There was little that he knew about these desert Paiutes, but all the red tribes had their own peculiar superstitions. Perhaps facing their teepees toward the rising sun was one native to these savages. He pointed the fact out to the girl. Baby, he whispered to her, I can get us some water yet. Unless they got a night guard posted at the spring, I can slide down this way to fill our bag and make it back without anybody being the wiser. Sayla's stubborn answer came promptly, If you go down there, I go with you. Without taking his seeking gaze from the teepees, Rip nodded. The girl might be safer than here on the ridge. Two, it would save the necessity of making the return climb. Walk light, he warned her grimly, and if you know any prayers start saying them. Yard by slow yard, Rip led the way toward the sleeping camp. He could feel the tenseness of the girl beside him, but her nerves were steady enough to keep her from making any unnecessary sound. The murmur of water spilling from its stone-lined hollow within the mesquite grove was audible now. It was music, the finest he'd ever heard. The deeper blackness of the stunted Mies quite trees rose before them. Rip pressed into the grove, and he caught the vagrant gleam of starshine on a coppery shoulder. Chapter 4 the Paiute's body twisted, and Rip threw himself aside, sweeping the girl along with him. A flung tomahawk whispered its death song where he had been standing. A single outcry or gunshot would rouse the camp. Rip pressed forward toward the stocky warrior, the long barrel of his navy colt raking out like a scythe. Starlight gleamed on steel in the hand of the Paiute. The scout parried the stabbing blade with the barrel of his colt and let momentum carry the gun on in and up. He heard breath gush from the Indian's mouth as the muzzle of the weapon rose beneath his chin. Rip struck again with merciless savagery. In a battle like this it was kill or be killed, and the lives of a hundred emigrants might depend on the A.C. curacy of his blow. The knowledge put power into his stroke. He felt the blue steel of his colt bite through coarse hair and contact bone. Shock ran the length of his arm, numbing his hand, and then the Paiute came tumbling toward him. He caught the brave with arm and upraised knee, and the limpness of the man's body as he slid to the ground told Rip 
that here was a coup he could count if he wanted it. There would be women wailing in the Paiute camp come morning, and there would be red wolves combing the salt seeking their revenge. This was the thought in Rip's mind, as he stared down somberly at the huddled warrior. He felt Sayla's hand on his arm. Rip, her ragged whisper came to him, are you hurt? No, the scout told her without turning his head, but we'll both be Paiute bait by morning or before. That means we've got to keep moving, and moving fast. There's just about one slim chance for us, he couldn't hide the truth from the girl now, and that is to keep hoping we'll run into Carpenter's train before the Paiutes spot us. Forget this cuss now. We've got to slake up what water we can, and hope the buckskin I wadded through that hole in our water bag will hold. Nothing had ever tasted better to rip than the clear spring water. It was something to remember, as they plodded along a trace that was like a tawny treadmill stretching ever before them. And gradually, the thing he had been dreading happened. He watched the deep blue of the night sky start to gray, and then change to salmon pink. Light stole slowly across the salt, and as it came he saw the girl's feet fail to lift. She stumbled, and only the quickness of his move saved her a fall. Arm around her waist, he supported her sagging weight. Salah raised a face that silent tears had streaked. Rip, I'm done, she said huskily. I, I can't go on. Leave me. Laughter that held no mirth touched Rip's lips. You could have left me before we started, he grunted. Put your arm around my neck. We're going to make that ridge up ahead. It'll be a right nice place to watch for Paiutes coming from one direction and Carpenter's train coming from the other. The eastern sky was filled with full dawn as Rip helped the girl up the last slanting rise to the ridge, and as he peered forward across the dun folds of the salt, his sudden shout made her open eyes that deadening fatigue had closed. Straight out there before them, dawn light was gilding the stained wagon, tilts of twenty, circled Conestogas with golden glory. Carpenter, Salah Burns cried, Jim Carpenter. Let's hurry. And I thought you were worn to a frazzle, he began, but he did not finish the sentence for the girl's sudden spurt of B, enough to rouse Salah from her faint. Her energy had left her. He saw her tumble forward into the road and lie still. That last five hundred yards he carried the girl. Alert guards stationed outside the ring of wagons saw the duo appear out of the morning and blinked their eyes. The man was over six feet and his fringed buckskins were ragged and torn. Burrs and blood and dirt had matted the mane of brown hair that swept to the fringed collar of his tunic. But it was his face they studied most as he drew near. A battered, bruised face, but it was still hard and resolute and ready to smile. This Jim Carpenter's outfit, Rip looked at the bearded guards, and he saw one of them nod. Right the first time, the man drawled and then he got a glimpse of the girl's white face cradled against Rip Campbell's chest. Hell, the guard exclaimed. If it ain't Ms. Salah Burns. Here, let me take her off your hands. My old woman will know just how to bring her around. His arms were aching, but Rip said stiffly without stopping to analyze his reasons, I'll carry her. You lead the way. He followed the guard into the enclosure, and the immediate contrast between this wagon train and the archer caravan struck him. Fat cattle instead of gaunt ones were inside a neat rope corral, along one curve of the circle. Cheerful children were shouting and romping at their first early morning play. Bustling women were preparing food above individual campfires. Teamsters and wagoners were looking to their harness and ox yokes. This was a busy, happy camp quite unlike the gloomy caravan the black-haired archer was leading. And as though by contrast, Jim Carpenter was himself a blonde. Standing almost six-four in his soft leather boots, he was one of the biggest men the scout had ever seen. Above six feet himself, Rip looked like a stripling alongside the wagon boss as Carpenter saw the new arrivals and came striding forward. Others were coming too from all sides. It was not often that a caravan received visitors in the middle of the salt desert. The scout felt her stir in his arms and lift her head. Put me down, Rip, she said softly. I, I can stand now. Hand on his arm for support, 
The girl had a smile for Jim Carpenter as he reached them. Jim, she said simply, this is Rip Campbell. If a better scout ever started for California, you'll have to show me. Carpenter's sharp blue eyes beneath bushy brows studied them both, and his answering smile was friendly. The hand he extended to Rip was like a ham. Rip took it with his left. The right, he explained, ain't much good. It don't have to be any good, Carpenter laughed. Sailor's stamp on you is enough for me, day or night. Women with heaped plates of steaming breakfast and mugs of hot coffee were already about them. But hungry as he was, Rip waved the food away and jerked his head at Carpenter. The captain understood and followed him a little distance from the group gathered about Salah Burns. When they were out of earshot, Rip paused and waited for the wagon master to come up to him. Carpenter, he said flatly, I was forced to kill a Paiute last night at a spring up ahead. There's quite an encampment about it, gathering mesquite beans for their winter food, I guess. When they find that buck, there's going to be some hot redskins romping back this away. My advice to you is to hole up right here until we see if they're willing to attack an outfit this size. Carpenter's bronze face was handsome in a heavily masculine way. He fingered luxurious burn sides that dropped to the lobe of his ear with a hand that looked as if it had been freshly manicured. It made Rip aware of two things. Jim Carpenter was a vain man, jealous of his authority as wagon master of this train. He was also a stubborn man, one who would do things his own way, come hell or damnation. Your advice is good, Carpenter admit Ted smoothly, but we're moving on just the same. I'll see that the cavy guard is redoubled, and we'll all keep our eyes peeled for trouble. Days mean too much now to waste a one of them. The Paiutes had vanished by the time the Carpenter train reached the neighborhood of the spring. Their huts had been demolished, and even some of their cooking baskets had been left behind in their withdrawal. Rip looked over the wrecked encampment from the back of a white riding mule brought from the cavy. It beats me, he told Carpenter, who was astride a black horse big enough to carry his weight. Then his eyes noticed that one of the huts had been burned to charred embers. Maybe it doesn't beat me so much at that, he added slowly. Most reds are a superstitious lot. These Paiutes point all their teepees toward the rising sun. Maybe they figured the spirit of the buck I killed last night might get into the teepees and bring them bad luck. They burned one of them just to make sure his spirit was gone, wrecked the rest, and skedaddled. I take it as a good sign, Carpenter's lips curled a little disdainfully. And I'm afraid I'll have to tell Salah that perhaps her judgment of you wasn't so keen after all. A good scout would have thought of this in advance. Rip drew a breath and held his tongue. Together, after a bountiful break fast, he and Salah Burns had jointly told Jim Carpenter of their suspicions concerning Bart Archer, and Carpenter had laughed at their fears. Archer's a vain fool, he proclaimed. Naturally, he has no love for me, nor I for him. But he isn't the vengeful type. What could he be planning anyway? You say he's ahead of us? All right, that means he has just decided to continue on over Emigrant Gap, instead of risking his party on some untried cutoff. That's sensible. Naturally, we'll keep our eyes peeled for trouble, but I think you're both exaggerating. Rip had gone to sleep with a bad taste in his mouth. And Carpenter's talk now wasn't improving it any. He was unable to keep the hardness out of his agate brown eyes as he stared at the wagon master. In a new country, he said deliberately, a man learns as he goes along if he's smart. This case ain't much in point. Archer is the cuss we've got to watch. The wagons moved on again after barrels banded to their sides were replenished and the stock watered. Outrider for the caravan, Rip had time to think as well as eye the desert for Paiutes as the days wore on. And the more he tried to divine the plan for revenge that lay in Bart Archer's twisted mind, the higher grew the wall of mystery. A few days, Archer had said. Well, three days had passed and nothing happened. Then a cry winging back to him from the long, snake-like procession roused Rip from his contemplation. He looked ahead at the caravan and saw all wagons halted along the line of march. 
From the rear wagons, men and even women in their wide skirts were running forward to converge on Carpenter's lead Conestoga. Lips tightening, Rip pressed forward, wondering at the cause of the excitement. As he passed halted wagons, grinning teamsters yelled the good news to him. We've hit the emigrant gap turn off, hooray for California. Chapter 5 Rip felt the words hit him like a choking fist. The emigrant gap turn off. Here. From the talk he'd heard in the Carson Sink camp, the turn off was many days drive ahead, where the whitened skull of an ox set on a pyre of stone marked the way to California. Yet, as he neared the group standing a few yards in advance of the lead wagon, Rip could see the monument with the ox skull on it. Salah Burns was standing beside Carpenter, and she gestured for him to join them. The girl's dark eyes were bright with excitement. Impulsively, she linked her hand through his arm, and Rip saw Jim Carpenter's lips tighten. Rip, Salah cried, isn't it wonderful? We've reached the turn off, and everyone thought it was days after on. The scout's answer came before he could stifle it. I still think so, he said flatly. Jim Carpenter laughed harshly. As usual, he drawled. You're wrong, you've got a pair of eyes in your head. Use them. There is your monument with the ox skull on top of it. And I presume you can spell words printed on it. They read, Emigrant Gap, Turn Off. Rip was using his eyes on more than that ox skull. This was not the turn off. He sensed it and yet there was nothing definite on which he could put his finger. The pyre of small rocks was neatly stacked. The skull was as it should be. He disengaged his arm from the girl, and silently turned to move along the wheel marks of the side road, seeking some sign to prove his point. The flanks of the Sierras had been close these last few days, never more than ten miles from the trace. Rip's eyes rose to the towering peaks seven thousand feet or more above the salt but their inscrutable crags couldn't give him the proof he sought. And yet, they were hitting the turn off too soon. He thought of Archer, and the deviltry that vengeful man had planned. If this was the trick his brain had conceived, every man, woman and child in the carpenter train might perish in the blind depths of some Sierra box canyon. There did appear to be a notch between the folded peaks Rip noted, and from where he was standing, it looked as though a long canyon led up to it. But he had trapped in the massive Rockies, and he knew how easily the appearance of terrain could change on closer approach. No, there was something wrong here. Yet the ruts of the turn-off road stretched on ahead, as far as he could see. Grimly, he turned back to the excited group about the monument, and the very somberness of his lean visage quieted many of the caravan folk. He stopped in front of the wagon master and Salah Burns. Carpenter, he said bluntly, in tones loud enough for all the listening emigrants to hear, Salah and I gave you the information we had concerning Archer and what we knew of the deviltry he planned. I ain't saying this is a part of it, but I'm asking you to hold the train right here until I can scout this turn off road, and on along the main trail that takes folks to Oregon. I won't be gone more than a couple of days. Days, days, Jim Carpenter's impatient voice cut the scout short. That's all I've heard from you, Campbell. We haven't. Time to waste on your suspicions. Time is short. We've got to cross the Sierras before snow flies. Even hours count. No, I'll give no such permission as long as I am captain of this train. We roll in ten minutes into the cutoff, and you will oblige me by taking your regular post. On a borrowed mount, Salah Burns rode out to the scout's wing position as the shadows of the long canyon closed them in. Her face wore the strained look of worry that had been on it when they had first met. She came alongside his riding mule, and her hand crossed to touch his arm. Rip, her dark eyes were imploring. I didn't say anything back at the monument because I hoped that I might be able to accomplish more by talking to Jim alone. But I couldn't. He won't listen to me. He just laughs when I mention Bart Archer. He, he even laughs at you. Rip shook his head. Men, he told her grimly, fall into two classes. There's fools who'll listen and learn. And there's others who have got to butt their heads against a wall. 
I hate to say it, but I'm thinking Carpenter is the second kind. However, that makes our opinions tally. That night, the long wings of the deep canyon closed them in on either side. Sweetwater was theirs for the taking from a brawling stream that filled the canyon bottom, and wagoners buoyed by hope forgot the day's fatigue and went out to bring in strings of rainbow and mountain trout to fill the fry pans of the emigrants. It was a night for celebration. California lay over the hill. Banjos and guitars made the music for an evening sing. Ordinarily, Rip enjoyed such an occasion as much as the rest, but tonight he found it hard to carry a tune. The trace led the train onward the next day, along a high grassy shelf above the Whitewater Creek. Jack Pine and Yellow Pine stippled the slope on their right. Snowbrush and Sumac added their own glossy green. And to men and women who had seen nothing for a fortnight but the Dun Desert, this was a fragrant paradise. Spirits were high as the day progressed. As he watched the happiness of everyone else, Rip felt his own spirits dropping. The canyon was rising steadily and growing narrower by the hour. Ox chains were groaning more frequently as the great beasts in their yokes strained dumb powerful muscles to obey the shouts of their masters. Shaking his head, Rip pressed his mule on ahead. The canyon narrowed and twisted ahead of him, but as he rounded a great buttress of gray granite, the way leveled out ahead. Here at least, Rip thought, the oxen and mules would have a chance to rest weary legs. He continued on across the narrow flat. The tracks of the trace were plain through the meadow grass. Almost too plain, the sudden thought came to Rip. It looked as though Conestoga wheels had only recently flattened this grass, and yet there were dim ruts in the earth beneath crushed stems. It's got me beat, Rip muttered the words aloud. He pressed onward through deep canyon gloom, into the gorge beyond the meadow. The shelf he had been following narrowed, and started a still steeper climb. The cliffs were high and sheer now on either side, towering a good hundred feet to pine-crested rims. Behind him, he could hear the caravan creaking into the meadow they had just quit. Carpenter was pushing the wagons, he thought. They were making good time, despite the steepness of the road. Pressing on, he rounded another bend underscore in the narrowing canyon, and then suddenly the gorge straightened like a rifle barrel in front of him. Three hundred yards away lay the end of it. A cliff, towering sheer for a thousand feet, boxed the end of the canyon. And at the bottom of it stood the skeleton hulks of six weathered Conestogas. For the space of a minute, surprise held the scout, and the crazy thought came to him that this was what remained of Bart Archer's caravan. Then he drove his heels into the flanks of the white mule, the true picture of what he was seeing apparent to him, at least. The wagons at the end of the box canyon had passed through one winter. Crushed tilts and warped sideboards was proof enough of what the weight of snow had done to them. Other wagons had been turned around here in this boxed end of the canyon, recently. Bart grass held the marks plainly, and at last Rip saw the picture clearly. Somehow Archer had learned that an earlier party of emigrants had taken this wrong turn off and left their tracks upon the desert. Cleverly, he had pulled out a half dozen wagons from his own caravan and brought them into this blind canyon to freshen up tracks already here. Then he had retraced his way to the regular trace and moved on ahead to join the rest of his train. It had cost him two days' time, but the burning vengefulness inside him might make him consider it worthwhile to force the carpenter train into this detour. However, nothing could keep them from turning back, just as Archer's wagons had done. The thought was still in his mind when the funnel of the narrow canyon brought sound rolling up to him. It shocked the scout like the report of a giant cannon. A rending booming roar that seemed to shake the mountains, and after it came a duller, more sustained roar, like the sound of a heavy waterfall. But even that dull, portentous rumble was fading into silence as Rip got his frightened mule quieted and turned back the way he had come. He forced the animal to a gallop, but the numb knowledge was spreading through him now that there was no need for hurry. No need at all. They wouldn't be going back to the salt. No, 
not a one of carpenters' twenty wagons with their load of human freight. Black powder, touched off by Bart Archer, had kicked a thousand tons of granite from the walls of the gorge. Granite enough to block any escape from this box canyon. It was as bad as he had guessed, Rip saw, as the white mule carried him back to the narrow meadow. Dust still drifted lazily upward from ragged monoliths the size of a house. A great, ragged scar lay where the high granite buttress had been before. And on the rim, a figure made diminutive by distance sat regarding his handiwork. Aboard the saddle on a clean-limbed gelding, Rip recognized both Ranger and Bart Archer. None of the stunned emigrants in this death canyon had so much as looked up yet to catch their sight of the man who had drawn them into this trap. But that was not Archer's pleasure. His vengeful shout came ringing down into the depths of the canyon. Let Carpenter laugh his way out of this, he cried. The steel of his long rifle, cradled across the bows of his saddle, felt cold against Rip's palms. He lifted the weapon almost without conscious thought as he brought the mule to a halt. Steady in his seat, he swung the rifle to his shoulder, and the sights seemed to line themselves with automatic ease upon the figure on the rim. The wind was bad, and Archer was beyond decent range, but there was a good charge of powder behind the ball in the barrel of his rifle. Rip caught his ranger horse across the sights and raised his aim slightly. His finger, as he squeezed the trigger, was cold as the granite that blocked their path of escape. Chapter 6 The rifle's report rang sharply through the canyon's silence, and Rip saw that distant shape on the rim stiffen in Ranger's saddle. Archer seemed to sway as he wheeled the horse. Then he disappeared into the cloaking blanket of pines that mantled the high slope. Like the knock of doom on the door, the sound of his rifle seemed to rouse the stunned caravan folk, for as he lowered the weapon slowly, Rip heard the shocked shouts of men who had been happy an hour before. He heard the cries of women and the sobbing of children. Salah Burns, slim and straight as a Paiute arrow in her man's trousers and open neck shirt, came racing toward him as he paced slowly nearer the disordered train. Rip swung down from the mule as the girl neared him, a glow of happiness that he could not analyze flowing through his body. I think you hit him, she cried, and her body seemed to seek his as she pressed against him. He felt her tremble and he wanted to hold her, but instead he pressed the girl back. There were hostile eyes watching them, he could guess, and this was no time to create dissension. He and Carpenter, and all the rest were going to have to pull together in the same yoke now. Across the girl's shoulder, Rip saw Jim Carpenter break from the huddle of emigrants about the wagons and stride slowly toward them. Braced for trouble with the wagon boss, he was surprised at Carpenter's appearance as the man stopped before them. His bronzed face had turned gray as the granite barrier blocking them into this death canyon. His blue eyes were clouded with misery. Campbell, he said raggedly, I've been a fool for not listening to you. A damn fool. But I won't be one any longer. I'm turning my authority as train captain over to you. Rip thought fast for a minute. It took a good man to admit error. If he accepted Carpenter's offer, the blonde giant wouldn't be worth a damn from here on in. Carpenter's courage and ready laugh to bolster the morale of other frightened people meant more than anything else right now. Studying the caravan leader, Rip said shortly, I wouldn't take your command on a platter, mister. You've had guts enough to bring a train close to 3,000 miles. Get back there and give those folks a grin. A glum face ain't going to get us out of this jackpot. We're in it together, and we'll lick it together. You tell them that. A deep breath stirred the wagon master's axe handle wide chest. He put his hand forward to the scout. Campbell, he said simply, you're a better man than me. Maybe I'll be giving orders to the rest of the company from now on, but I'll be taking mine from you. From the tail end of the caravan nearest the fantastic slide, a voice cried thin and full of fear. The creek's rising, it's damned up. We'll drown like rats in here. Rip felt a grim surge of power vibrate through him. He had felt the secret well of strength open inside his body before 
when situations had looked hopeless. And none had ever looked more hopeless than this. His eyes were burning brown orbs as he glanced down at Salah Burns. Go tell that fool, he snapped, that nobody is going to drown. We can pull our wagons into the boxed end of the canyon above the slide line if we have to. He watched the girl hurry away as Carpenter said somberly, Campbell, if we're forced to do that, not a one of us will ever leave this canyon alive. The snows aren't far away, and we haven't provisions enough to last out a month. Rip knew that as well as the wagon master. The thought of the snows to come was like a weight in his own mind. A memory picture of those pitiful shells of once proud Conestogas at the inner end of this box canyon came before his eyes. That was what the carpenter train would look like next spring if winter caught them here. There's six wagons at the end of this canyon, he spoke almost to himself, and they were fools for ever having driven that far in. The cliffs back there are a thousand feet high. Here, his brown eyes lifted thoughtfully to the western wall of the gorge. They ain't over a hundred. There's enough slant to them so a man might climb to the rim. But women and children and stock could never make it, Carpenter said hoarsely. With that water rising, we've got to do something, and do it quick. If we're pushed back, we're lost. Rip nodded. He studied the western escarpment again then turned his eyes down canyon. Already the brawling stream had widened perceptibly. By morning or before, this meadow would be awash. We've got tonight, he muttered the words to himself, and then his eyes sparked as they found the captain. God helping us, there's a way we can get out of here, women, wagons, stock and all. The leader's tense face showed surprise. How? Ropes, Rip said. Every wagon has got rope in it. Light or strong, it don't matter. We'll use each for what it'll hold if it's long enough to stretch to the rim come running, mister. This is something for everybody to hear. Five minutes later, Rip was staring into a sea of anxious faces, but he wasn't seeing them. He was seeing the plan for their salvation unfolding in his mind. We're going over the rim, he told them crisply. Archer can't whip us if every one of you works out the night. There's a job for each. I'm leaving the organizing of crews to you, Carpenter. We'll need men to cut wood for bonfires, and women to keep the blazes going to give us light. Bulldoggers to hogtie oxen and mules. I'll need ten of the toughest on top with me to haul up the wagons and supplies as they're hitched into the slings down here. Some of you get to dismantling the wagons, right now. And some of you women start cooking up grub. We're going to need hot food and coffee to keep this job going. But we can swing it. Swing it or go down fighting, Carpenter shouted. And his booming infectious laugh was like a pledge that no man or woman would die here in this boxed canyon of death. Fires at top and bottom burned the short night hours away. Logs set to keep ropes from chafing had long since been worn smooth. Pulleys howled as men bent their backs to raise heavy Conestoga wheels and the bulky boxes of wagons. It was a fantastic task, a red nightmare fought against creeping time. Rip found himself everywhere, a thousand details needing his attention. And ever below them, as he peered downward, was the widening black mirror of that rising stream. The red stars wheeled overhead, and the night wind had a frosty bite as it came sweeping down from timbered heights. Rip had ordered each wagon and its load of supplies bunched to simplify. The process of assembling them in the morning. Ten were up when rising water snuffed one of the great bonfires lighting the meadow below. Rip saw the flames dwindle like a giant candle burning to the end of its wick. Poised on the rim, he sent his harsh voice winging down to those fighting folk in the meadow. Abandon the rest of the wagons, he ordered. Get up a few more slings of food and clothes. Shoot the stock we haven't saved. Then make ready to ride the slings yourselves. Somberly, he regarded the death canyon below. In some far-off camp on the true trail to Emigrant Gap, Bart Archer would be chuckling. Weary to the point of numbness, Rip still could not rest as he saw other dead tired emigrants sprawl on the brown needles beneath the pines. Not one of the company had been lost. 
A few had been scratched and bruised on the hall up the cliff, but that was all. Ten wagons had been abandoned. On the morrow, trout would be swimming through their tilts. One shape stirred beneath the pines. Salah Burns had seen the lonesome shape of the scout standing beside the heaped coals of one of the bonfires. A blanket in her arms, she came toward him. Rip, her voice was gentle, put this around you and lay down. You can't keep going forever, and and we'll need you more tomorrow than we do now. Rip felt her words drain the last strength from him, and somehow or other he found himself on the warm earth beside the coals, and the girl's gentle hands were covering him with the blanket. A club over the head could have put him to sleep no more quickly. Dawn and its problems came before the scout realized that he had been asleep. He met Carpenter at the breakfast fire when women prepared a community meal, and drew the captain aside. Jim, he said soberly, we've each got a job. Yours is to get the wagons and company assembled. I'll tackle the job of scouting a route for us. We're too high now to try to backtrack to the salt. So we've got to push ahead. I've got two ideas on that score. If we cut across country to the west, we're bound to hit the emigrant gap road sooner or late. That means tough travel and days, maybe even weeks of it. Might be we'll hit canyons where we'll have to dismantle and lower the wagons, haul them up the other side like we've done here. That takes time. And your other plan? Carpenter asked. Just this, Rip said bluntly. A trapper and scout learns to gamble. I'm ready to believe we can climb this ridge to the gap I spotted yesterday. Won't likely have any canyons to cross, but the going may be rough. When we hit the summit, we'll try and work west to the emigrant gap road. Either way we're gambling, Jim Carpenter said slowly. I'll take the big one with you. Start blazing your trail, mister. A cold wind that brought its definite threat of winter whipped Rip as the white mule, Ginger, carried him upward between the Isle of Giant Pines. Short axe gripped in his left hand, he made his slow way up the ridge, estimating the distance between trees, seeking the easiest path for the giant Conestogas to follow. For a thousand feet, the trail was open. Then a tangle of windfall trees, like a gigantic pile of jack straws, blocked his progress. Lips set, the scout detoured to the left. Here the slope grew dangerously slant, but with ropes caught to wagon boxes and snubbed about trees, the wagons could be held and inched on forward. For forward they must go with no time spent on road building, if it could possibly be avoided. Once, when he broke into a high mountain meadow, he could glimpse the peaks high above the toiling wagons that would be following the blazes he had left on trees. Breathing those implacable iron crests was a gray scud of clouds. At the sight, he clenched his fists. He felt like shaking them at the heights, but that would do no good. Snow was an enemy that man couldn't whip with his fists. Speed was the only thing that would aid them now. Fleetingly, Rip thought of Bart Archer and his gloom caravan westward on the emigrant Gap Road. Then he forced his attention back to the task at hand. After that it was twist and turn and climb, blaze trees and climb again. Mid-afternoon came, and the ridge tipped suddenly forward into a level-floored canyon. The gap rip spoke the words aloud, and the crying of the wind in the pines on either flank mocked him. It was time to turn back, but he had to see what lay beyond this deep V between the high-flying peaks. The mule was game for the run. Thick meadow grass rip saw as he rode would make fine graze for gaunt cattle and mules. For a mile straight between the cloud-wreathed peaks above, he followed the meadow, and then the gap widened as the mountains curved back on either side into a wide plateau. A plateau that stretched westward for as far as he could see. Rip relaxed with a sigh of relief. Archer had led them into a death trap, but sweat and toil had saved every life, and part of the wagons. Archer had led them into a death trap, and from his vengefulness had come this pathway to salvation as the twinkle of burning campfires led the scout back to the wagon camp, long after chill dark had closed in the mountains. Joy at the report he had to make to the assembled company, supplanted the stunned gloom of the previous day. I'm not saying it will all be clear sledding, he finished bluntly, 
but we've got a good chance of following that plateau until we strike the emigrant gap road. I figure it will take us at least three days more to make it to the pass I found through the peaks. How far we'll have to travel the plateau after that is anybody's guess. Rip made no mention of the snow clouds he had seen wreathing the high peaks. There was no use rousing fear in these people. They had suffered enough already. And happiness and anticipation, he knew, would keep a man going longer than the spur of fear. Three days, he had judged, it would take them to reach the pass above. Instead, it consumed six. Six days that saw another wagon abandoned, when animals grown gaunt from insufficient feed were unable to pull the Conestoga a foot farther. We'll use the yoke for replacements, Rip told Carpenter. Maybe the big fellas will get some meat on their bones without a wagon to pull. Strain was showing on everyone now, and Rip saw eyes turn anxious whenever their faces lifted toward the sky. It was the tail of the sixth day when the train leveled into the pass. Cattle so gaunt their bones were almost breaking the skin, halted in their tracks and attacked the fresh grass. Camp was made right there and spirits climbed that night as someone brought forth a banjo for Salah Burns to play. Oh, Susanna was the popular song, for California was just over the hill. Danged if you can't almost smell that yellow gold out yonder, one emigrant chuckled. Aside where they could converse without interruption, Rip talked earnestly to the wagon master. The cattle and mules are about done in, Jim. We may not like it, but we've got to lay over here a couple of days, and give them some rest or we may never make the emigrant gap. Carpenter nodded his blonde head. Yes, the giant agreed. I had the same thought. Something struck the wagon master's hand then. Rip saw Carpenter's eyes tip down, and through the gloom he spotted the faintest fleck of white against the other's brown skin. Something cool and feathery brushed his own cheek in the same instant and then both men looked up to stare long and soberly at each other. Over at the campfire, Rip heard voices break abruptly from the song they were singing. Snow, someone cried. Men and women were starting to their feet in something close to panic. The scout's long legs carried him into the fire-lit circle. Hold up, he spoke to them sharply. There ain't no cause for alarm if you keep your heads. We've come too far to let a little snow stop us now but there's things to be done the rest of tonight besides sing. Every pound of weight in the wagons that ain't essential has got to go. That means everything but food and blankets. Cleaning out the Conestogas is up to you women. As for the rest of us, we got a chore to do. Boys, men your captain figured to lay over here and fatten the teams for a couple of days. If snow's coming, we can't do it. Yet we got to keep our oxen and mules fed just the same. So get out your knives and start cutting grass. Pack the wagons with every danged ounce they'll hold. Keep our stock strong and we'll pull through. Starve them and we'll starve too. Cold came with the morning, and the snow was inches deep as protesting oxen broke the wagons into motion again. The white blanket crackled beneath iron tired wheels, leaving a lacy pattern behind the moving conestogas. Cheeks flushed with cold, Salah rode in the lead with Rip to help search out the smoothest path for the wagons to follow. He was glad for her company. There'd been little chance to be alone these last few days, and yet when it came to talking to the girl, he found himself strangely tongue-tied. If this chill holds, Rip told her a little gruffly, we won't get any more snow. But if it warms up, look out for trouble. Salah nodded. Her lips were chapped but she could still smile. Faded. I keep thinking of mother, she murmured, and all the rest of them. I wonder where they are now. Has the snow been worse farther west? Or have they managed to beat it over the hump? I, I suppose we'll never know until we reach the lowlands and hangtown. There's just one thing certain, Rip told her grimly. Archer will get them over the hump if he can. He's had his revenge. He figures us for goners. So you can bet your dollar that he'll pull his own outfit through if he can. We, we might even meet on the road down, Salah said. Rip gave her a cool, straight glance. I would like nothing better, he told her quietly. 
For three days as they rolled slowly west along the plateau, the cold held while clouds kept massing in the sky. Their grayness was like an oppressive weight, and desperation was driving them all now. Rip offered to go on ahead to try to cut the gap road, but Jim Carpenter vetoed the plan. We lose you, Campbell, and none of us will make it. If a storm breaks while you're gone, you'd never find your way back. No, we've got to hang and rattle together. The fourth day dawned, and the air had a softer, warmer feel against the scout's cheek as he and Carpenter saw the wagons lined out behind their advance. A sudden thought came to Rip. Hitch ropes. From tongue to tailgate of each wagon, he suggested, and another line from your lead wagon to the cantles of our saddles. We'll keep pushing on, snow or no damned snow, and we won't need to worry about wagons getting lost or out of line. The first flurry hit them before the job was finished, looking across his shoulder through the falling flakes. Rip watched men and even women struggling to string ropes between the wagons as they kept moving. By the time Carpenter was back beside him with lines to hitch to their own saddles, even the lead wagon fifty feet behind them was nothing but a dim blur. Through the muffler wrapped about his face Carpenter howled, Here it is, Campbell. Then the smile Rip nodded without trying to speak. No words were needed. Each of them knew that if they didn't reach the descending gap road before the day was out, they would never make it. Five feet of snow would blanket this plateau by morning and weary oxen could not smash their way through drifts that high. Only the lines strung between the wagons were keeping some from straying now, Rip knew, as he and Carpenter paced blindly forward into the teeth of the blizzard. The feel of wind and snow against his face guided Rip. For an hour he kept the gusts coming from a quartering direction, and that meant he was still headed in a straight line forward. The mule stumbled beneath him, then tipped forward, they were at the head of a sharp declivity. Pines reared like white ghosts on either side suddenly, and Rip gritted his teeth at a nod from Carpenter and let the wagons come on. A man couldn't tell what lay at the bottom of this slope. Perhaps a canyon bottomless for a thousand feet. And perhaps it was a grim guess, the gap road they sought might lie just ahead. As though his thoughts had conjured a picture, Rip saw something loom out of the driving curtain ahead. It looked like the high, ghostly tilt of a prairie schooner, and then it was gone in the scud. But another seemed to take its place, and he knew that he couldn't be mistaken a second time for they were close enough now for sounds to reach them. Flying toward them on the howling blizzard wind, Rip heard the rattle of ox chains, the groaning of loose fellows in wagon wheels. His mitten hand brushing back to his hip, he got his knife from beneath the heavy coat an emigrant had loaned him. He slashed the rope binding him to the lead wagon behind them, and plunged ahead. He heard Carpenter cry something that sounded like, Archer. Archer. Yes, this could be Archer's caravan traveling the emigrant road. Breath suddenly hot in his chest, Rip dropped the mule into the roadway. Navy colt in hand, he swung the animal's head uphill as another Conestoga lurched into view. Lifting his gun, he fired a single shot into the sky, for it was about the only sound a half-blinded driver would hear and comprehend. He saw plodding mules halt as the reins man on the box drew in. Rip pressed alongside the wagon. Hold her, he shouted against the force of the wind. There's an outfit coming in from the side. And who might be their captain? He heard the question thinly through the crying of the wind. Jim Carpenter, Rip answered the driver. Glory be, the shout that answered him was louder. You couldn't name a better man to me, nor plenty of the rest. Bart Archer's been spreading it around for the last week, that Carpenter's outfit wouldn't be seeing California this year. Maybe, Rip didn't speak the words very loudly but they seemed to carry to the driver above him. Archer is the one who won't be seeing the Sacramento. If you're that pilgrim he trumped, I'll lay my bets on you. Salah Burns must have found ye, and together you tied in with Carpenter. Her mother will be mighty glad to hear that. We did, Rip said. Archer. Up ahead, the driver chuckled. I'll hold the rest back till your caravan sandwiches Tino line, if you want to make a ride. 
Grip turned the mule without more words, and the wind at his back seemed to blow him forward. He thought fleetingly of Salah Burns and Jim Carpenter. The captain had turned into a mighty decent man. He'd have plenty to offer an Argo Knot girl, beside the dream of a rancho looking out to the sea. And the caravan itself was safe now. On this downhill grade they could bull through drifts that would halt a wagon on the level. Yes, the combined trains could make the lowlands now, even through the howling scud of blizzard snow. He was thinking about that, when a tall, muffled shape on a bay horse that had clean, familiar lines loomed out of the whiteness before him. He recognized Ranger before he identified its rider. Then Bart Archer's imperious voice came at him. What in damnation is holding up the rear wagons? TM, Rip said the words quietly, and his face was recognizable as the MUF flare slipped down to his throat. Archer's eyes through their rime of frost were startled, but the man was quick to recover. With a movement swift as the strike of a snake, he flipped a long knife from the sleeve of his big coat. Rip saw the glint of it and heard the man's howled words. I didn't finish my job once. I will this time. Without mercy or regret, Rip triggered the colt in his left hand. Archer had been full of treachery from the beginning. He would never change. Rip saw his lead catch the man full in the chest, and the knife halfback for throwing never left the caravan leader's hand. The scout watched the blade drop from opening fingers, and then Archer's body was slumping across Ranger's saddle. Rip swung forward to steady the man, and he knew that the limp shape under his hand was dead even as he touched him. The somber thought came to the scout that morning would find an other, unmarked and lonesome grave on the road to California. They buried Bart Archer that night, below the white belt where the blizzard still howled, and Jim Carpenter pronounced the last somber ritual. Dust thou art to dust returneth, friends, he added soberly. I cannot find it in my heart to say more, either for or against this man. Rip was conscious of Salah beside him, and he felt the quick tension of her fingers against his palm as Carpenter finished speaking. Let's walk, she whispered. And Rip, with shy diffidence, asked a question that had to be answered before they reached the Sacramento. Maybe you'd rather wait for Jim. Salah Burns' eyes lifted to the scout's sober face. You may, she said acidly, know a lot about traps and mountains, but you don't know much about women. Rip walked with the Argonaut girl, and he knew in his heart that he had found the thing he wanted these long wandering years. Thank you for reading this classic western adventure. Can I send you Wrangler, a 60k word full-length classic style Wild West adventure for free?